Hey, this is TC. And this is Jim from The Studio Demands It. A bi-weekly screenwriting podcast where every episode we conceptualize and craft an entire script from the ground up based on the demands of one of our listeners acting as a hypothetical studio. Join the process over at studiodemandsit.com. Hello and welcome to the Turn by Turn podcast. My name is Daniel and I'm joined with Chris as always or as frequently as possible. And today we are talking. Actually, we're probably going to have to rename the show for this episode. We'll call it Turn by Stop because on this episode we are talking about games where we took a turn and then we stopped because uh, for various reasons, we did not feel compelled to continue our turn-by-turn journey. So, turn-by-stop for this episode. So, I uh, want to open up with a little disclaimer that um, so a lot of the games on my list, I stopped, but it's not necessarily because I thought they were, were trash or terrible, but um, there's specific reasons why I stopped. So, without further ado... Chris, what is your no? Well, maybe not number one game, but what's the first game on your list that was made you stop playing? Okay, so some of mine I do think are trash and are terrible. <laughs> oh yeah, some of them um, might be, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> New I'll, ones. <laughs> I'll open with one of those, um, and this is one that I think uh, I don't remember how I got it. It was probably a family member being like, oh, you liked the book in the movie. So here's the game. So uh, it was Aragon for the Game Boy Advance, <laughs> <laughs> which is a turn-based R- like Final Fantasy-style RPG. Um, and uh, it was real bad. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't... You... Go ahead, sorry. So what was the sort of factor that was like, this is not good, I need to not finish this? Uh, Okay, so for starters, no one looks like they should at all. Um, Because there's always that sort of thing in your head that's like you envision the characters in your head, and then you you go maybe see the movie, and the characters don't look like you envisioned. Well, Aragon was already that in spades. No one looked quite like I thought they should. Um, And then there were lots of characters just missing. And then uh, porting that idea to the Game Boy Advance, it was like the character, they they modeled the characters off of the movie versions, but they also don't look anything like the movie versions. So now we're like two, it was like somebody read the book and described that to the casting director for the movie. And then someone that watched the movie described that to someone else who didn't watch the movie who was trying to model it on the Game Boy. (laughs) And so it was just like third or fourth hand at that point is what it felt like. Um, And then they were just horribly ugly. Like the art style they went with was just awful. Was it Um, bitter? Yeah, I mean, the way that I would kind of... uh, the thing I would compare it to was like, if you remember the Game Boy Advance Fire Emblem games, when we went to Shadow Dragon uh, on the DS, the portraits still look fine, but the in-game art, like the battle animations, those look a little bit to be desired, I think. Um, it was kind of that art that was like, you tried to be really realistic, but like we're on the Game Boy Advance, and so they just kind of don't have faces like, it just didn't really work. You can't do these fine details that you're trying to do in this. So everything just kind of looks like a blob. Okay. Um, but it was also exceedingly difficult. Uh, and I had no clue where to go or, like, what to do ever. Like, it was it was just very confusingly put together. Level design left a lot to be desired. It was ugly, horribly difficult. Um, And then they also based, like I said, based it on the movie, which was already a bad retelling of the book. Um, And now that I'm older, I realize, too, I don't think the book is that special either. (laughs) So it was just kind of, it just is a chain of, like, a bad retelling of a bad retelling of a 
okay story. That uh, since since you went back to the Game Boy Advance, I will. Um, when I was growing up, I had the Game Boy, and we had this Star Trek game where supposedly you go on missions and you like fly through outer space trying to solve the missions. And I remember like trying to play it like hundreds of times and go, like go through and try to solve these missions and not being able to nail any of them. And it like a lot of the original Game Boy games are really difficult. Because that's all we had back in my day. I know. <laughs> I'm dating myself by listing Game Boy games. But I just remember it being like borderline impossible. Yeah, I had some of those. But I kind of got lucky somehow in that I mostly had really good Game Boy and Game Boy Color games. Because mm-hmm. they played on a... I had the Advance, Game Boy Advance SP and it played both of those. Okay. So I could do whatever i ended up with stuff like donkey kong country one and uh i had like an x-men one that was neat so it it, i i had good luck Mm -hmm. okay so what would be the next one on your list uh sure um the next one on my list i will jump ahead a little bit and uh i should have looked up this title beforehand give me like half a second uh, Inuyasha, Secret of the Divine Jewel on the Nintendo DS. Okay, and that's an anime, right? Yes, okay. it is. It's one that I like a lot that I should really go rewatch at some point. Um, and I don't remember too terribly much about the game. Um, I just remember it was another case of being exceedingly difficult. Um, and I ended up soft locking myself and i'm not like i'd played rpgs before that i was still quite young but like i mean i had made it through several pokemon games by that point at least um and maybe fire emblem sacred stones and path of radiance i'm not sure maybe it was a little before that um but i i definitely played uh, at least a handful of rpgs before that so it was like it's not just me being terrible i don't think um, but the, the deal was, was that, um, the random encounters for the battles were just extremely high. Like the percent was ridiculous. It felt like you'd take two steps and that's another random encounter. Um, and if I remember right, there wasn't a great way to, a reliable way to get out of it. So you mostly had to fight that. Um, and then anytime you went to a town, that's kind of where it saved you and so you that your save point was that town um and i think it like auto saved there so i remember my characters were all pretty low health because you kind of go you know town to wilderness to town um so it took me a lot to get to the next town so i make it there and i can't see any way to heal any of my characters but I have super low health. So then if I leave the town and take like two steps, I get into a random encounter that I can't escape. I party wipe and I game over and then it just loads you back to your last save, which for me is that save in the town. And my party still has super low health. There's no way to restore their health and I can't go anywhere. So I'm just stuck perpetually in this town. And I tried a ton to get out of it. Um, I, I tried everything I was capable of my dad was a high school band director for a number of years. And sometimes I would go hang out at the high school with him. And I knew there were like fellow nerd kids at the high school. So at one point uh, I talked to some of them, like, cause I was around a little bit. So I remember I was going up there for some sort of event that uh, the band was having. And some of the students I knew would just be hanging around. And I figured one of these anime nerds like me would be hanging around. And I was right. So I brought my DS to one of them and was like, hey, you're like older and wiser. Can you get me unstuck from this somehow? And he was like, yeah, sure, little man, I got you. And he did his best. And at the end, he was like, nope, (laughs) I think I think it's time to delete that save. And I was like, no. (laughs) And so I closed uh, my DS and I took that game out and I never played it again. (laughs) That's almost kind of (laughs) sad. 
go well, back. I, Someday I, you have to go back. Oh, yeah. How did you know uh, about my idea for the sequel to this episode? <laughs> <laughs> the, the We Finally Went Back episode? Yeah, why not? Like, I, I'd still have it. I'd be willing to revisit it. It's That's a decent segue to my next one, unless you had a, more thoughts there. <laughs> No, that's about it. I love Inuyasha, but a good RPG, I am not quite sure they made. So my next one is one I will be going back to, and I will get to my... So mine is Knights of the Old Republic. Ah! And I grinded very, very hard and was actually enjoying the game quite a bit until I did get softlocked. And the reason why I stopped is I was playing the mobile version. Mm. And I got so locked and had no, basically couldn't play anymore because I had like zero health, no way to heal, constant battles. So after about 15 different attempts to get out of the situation I had gotten myself into, I had to stop. And so the big kicker here of why I stopped is that it was on mobile. And it, the the UI is a little different on mobile, I believe. Since I haven't played the regular version, I'm not sure. But I would assume it's probably pretty different. So I eventually ground a hole so deep I could not continue. But I definitely plan on going back. But it definitely totally killed the experience for me. So how did you get softlocked? I'm Revan, I suppose. I also don't have the full context of the game, so this is going to be a little jank as far as explanation goes. <laughs> but um, you meet up with a um, rebel officer, and you and the officer have to patrol, and you eventually get two allies, like a Toyalek and a Wookiee. And I lost all of them and only had my main character left. And it was like in between like healing places. Mm. And I it auto saves for you. So like it auto saved past like the point of starting over. Yeah. And then there was no way to go forward without restarting. And it would always bring me back to that save point where I had no health and all my people were dead. It's sort of just a horrible confluence of events that sort of led to me giving up on it but i was kind of enjoying the story before i lost it and i definitely would like to go back because i've i've obviously since then read a lot about it and figured out what the rest of the story was yes so i know it's something i'd like to go back to but it's gonna i need to heal I know what you mean. I actually, if, if uh, that's a perfect segue to one I forgot about, because um, I did eventually go back and finish it, but I actually had a similar experience with Knights of the Old Republic too. In that uh, I made it to the final planet, and without spoilers, um, your your party is split up a little bit, and then uh, at one point I got a. I forget what they're called, like a hollow call from one of my party members. Um, so he's like the blue static, you know, that people show up like in Star Wars when they're calling you. Um, and that conversation ended. And then I ended up like when it put me back in control of my character, it put me back in control of him as that blue static thing. Oh, really? Yeah. Which was That's not weird. correct. Um but I had not played the game before and I was really young as well. And it happened so seamlessly <laughs> that I, I was like, okay, that's weird. Like, what am I supposed to do like this? And he's got a little robot too, that I could take control of. So my thought was like, Oh, I'm supposed to use the little robot to like do something around the map to like help my other characters because the party is split. And I just could never figure it out. And then I finally, like, looked up a walkthrough and saw that it was like, yeah, and when you finish that conversation, the player gains control. Like, you know, you carry on as 
normal. And I was like, oh, I don't switch to that guy. Looking at my older saves, the only other save I had before was before like that final planet. Um, and so it was, it ended up being like something like 20 something hours behind maybe further. So I was just like, I think I'm done for now. Like Daniel said, I need time to heal. And one day I will play this again and not, not, uh, get soft locked. And I eventually did, but it took many years before I was ready to come back and finish that. So my next one is Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon. So this is a very, very eerily similar situation to what you just described, where um, in my early Fire Emblem days, I was quite the rapscallion and would just let people stay dead and the other games are way more forgiving if you let some people die than shadow dragon is because in shadow dragon when you lose characters you get fill-ins if you lose too many so what we should say first you get extra chapters to recruit new characters and if you lose all those then you get (laughs) then you get these like significantly de-leveled character replacements sort of just like fill in like Bowie characters that like are arbitrarily named and have very useless weapons and skill sets. So I got to basically the very last battle in the game and I had like four like actual characters left and they gave me like three or four fill ins that were like, massively under leveled like they couldn't even like be shields they were literally just one hit they're gone cannon fire so i grinded through the entire game with like four characters and then it got to the point where in the final battle there's a couple of different your team is split up into different quadrants on the map and you sort of make your way to the middle and it just, there was no way it was happening. And I had already, um, at that point in the game, had jumped back like four or five battles just to re-get some people back. And I had lost those people that I had gone back for the first time. So I guess in short, I'm terrible at Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon. But in my defense, I feel like there's a pretty noticeable difficulty difference between the ones I had played at that point in that one. I mean, yeah, uh, definitely a possibility. Um, are you ready for my next one? Yeah. Take it away. All right. My next one is going back to the game boy advance is Lord of the rings, the fellowship of the ring. And Mm -hmm. that, that was a, uh, Another, like, almost Diablo-style RPG, and then it would bring you into turn-based combat when you got into a fight. And it wasn't the combat on this one that drove me away. Um, And I'm not sure this one was a bad game, either. It was that... uh, It was another just too difficult. Um, I was, again, very young playing this, um, and I made it into the Mines of Moria. And you have to, like, solve a puzzle by, like, reading Elvish and stuff. And it was just way too above (laughs) my head as a kid. Like, it just was not going to happen. I I wanted to love a lot of the Game Boy, Game Boy Advance, Lord of the Rings games, but they're all really brutal, either in difficulty or appearance or gameplay. Like, take your pick. They're all really bizarre. I mean, that was definitely my experience. Like, the GameCube ones are all hits, but the Game Boy ones, ooh, rough. I I also asked uh, one of my best friends what uh, some of the games he quit were Mm -hmm. and why. And so I thought we could include those just for uh, another perspective. So one of the ones he quit uh, for a different reason than we've given so far was the game Tyranny, which I'm not super familiar with. But uh, it's apparently an RPG of sorts. And uh, he had a really peculiar reason to me for quitting this one in that he said 
a large portion of the game is voice acted, and a large po- portion of the game is also not voice acted. And he was like, the going back and forth between these two things was just super difficult because he was like, it would get me into a habit of just sitting and listening to, you know, the story being told to me. And then it would go, okay, now read all this text. And he was like, I, I really struggle to go back and forth between those two things. Like either, if, if the expectation that we're starting with is you want me to read a bunch of text, that's fine. Just have me read that. Um, and if the expectation, you know, he, he just really didn't like that it mixed it up in very large doses of both. So I thought that was kind of a funny reason, but I don't know, maybe, maybe that really bothers other people. I know that with the voice acting, it annoys me if it's like halfway, if it's like some scenes are voice acted and then other scenes, the characters just kind of make like shrug sounds when their lines come out, that kind of annoys me. Hmm. Especially if it feels like it's in inco- like if it's inconsistent, like I get if it's just for like important scenes, but every once in a while it'll be just like a random scene will be voice acted and then there'll be something important happening and your main character will be like, huh? It'll be like Sims and it's just kind of like sound effects for voices rather than like acting the scene. So it's just like, what was it? What, what was the point of that going halfway? Uh, time and money. Yeah. But, but I'm not it's worried not, about time and money for the games. <laughs> yeah, it's not something that bothers me too much, so I don't totally care. Um, the only thing that really bothers me is if your voice acting is different from what the text is, and I've had that happen a couple times in that. Oh, that drive me nuts. Oh my gosh, yeah, because I'm, I'm trying to read and listen to you at the same time because you're not saying the same things, and... Yeah, that got old real fast. Yeah, no, no, thank you. <laughs> uh, we'll do we'll do another of my friends uh, real quick. Uh, another of his was uh, the RPG series Battle Mech, um, and he has said that he refuses to be counted out. He is going to go back and do it again at some point um, with a friend's help. But he said the problem was is that uh, the game is again very difficult. And he said, if you want to level up your mechs and stuff, you can play on easy and get experience. But that does not, uh, you need to spend money on things like ammo and repairs. And playing on easy, the the monetary reward you get from that is not enough to cover your costs of actually going into battle. So he was like, you can definitely, you're not going to stay afloat that way. So he said, playing on medium missions is like the, peak of what he's capable of but it's right there and he said that barely gives you enough money to stay afloat and if you end up dying then the amount of money it costs to replace your mech or buy a new one is i mean there goes all your progress right there and then he was like hard playing any of the hard missions um he said he's been safe scumming for a little bit and he's not been able to do that without a full team or party wipe so he's like i just don't know exactly how I'm going to be able to get through that. Um, So, yeah, but stick around Uh, after the break. We're going to go into some of my more hot takes, and we're going to talk about games that people actually care about a little bit more than Aragon for the Game Boy Advance and Lord of the Rings Fellowship of the Ring for the Game Boy Advance, because I've got some uh, higher tier games that I have quit, and we'll talk about why. I know. I have some kind of hot topic-y ones on my list as well. So there's your big market tease that we're always supposed to do before the break. So we will talk to you after that. Bye, everybody. Hello and welcome to Game Dev Hideout. My name is Daniel, and I am excited to introduce our new 6.5 show. Joining me is my co-host Chris as we drop down the ladder and give you a look into the indie game development community. We'll introduce you to lots of cool game developers, pixel artists, musicians, and other members of the indie dev community. We hope you'll climb on up and check out some games. I know 
nothing about Pokemon. And lucky for you, I know a lot. So here are the top five reasons to listen to this season of Top 5 Nintendo. Number five, we give you the real answers on Pokemon. Number four, we help you improve your game strategy so you'll never lose again. Number three, you can observe our bond of friendship. Number two, you can anticipate the excitement of a new Pokemon game with us. Number one, and most importantly, you can relive some nostalgia of over 25 years of Pokemon. See you there. Back from our break. What's your next one? <laughs> okay. Um, if you want an actual uh, hot take. Um, yeah, we I've need something couple. fiery after my boring one. Oh, I've got a couple. Um, we'll start with Borderlands, the pre-sequel. Oh, interesting. Um, and there's a myriad of reasons. <laughs> I, I gave it a shot. It was my first Borderlands. Um and I gave it a shot because people, uh, a couple people around me just rant and rave about Borderlands and how much they like it. And I've always liked the art style. Um, I think the character design in that game is fantastic. And uh, whoever is behind that should be really proud of themselves. Because um, not much looks like that. And it's hard to say that about a really modern game. But the multiple reasons, I didn't like it. Um, we'll start from a mechanical perspective, um, and that was that uh, I didn't like the loot system at all. It would constantly give me new loot. I, I mean, it just threw it heaps mountains of just rubbish on you, and to begin to like sort through that just took so much time. It was so much inventory management, being like, "Is this gun better than the gun I already had?" And I get that there's like some sort of, it, it, to some extent, there's some procedural loot generation. And so the guns are a little bit randomized and that's like a selling point of the series. But it just took so long being like, okay, is this gun good or bad? And it just, it required a lot of reading and, and tons of inventory management. And I do not like lots of inventory management. I want something really, really broken down that would be like scattershot does X amount of damage uh has x effect but there is like so much text and just so so many of them that i just got burnt out and then the story as well the characters like had weird references to like irl hot like real life hot topics at the time and i was just like i don't care for that in like escapist media very much um it was just kind of the right some of the writers ranting about like IRL things, and I was like, this feels really, really weird. Uh, so I ended up quitting and not going back to it. So did it burn you on like the the series completely, or is it just that one? I think so. Um, and it would be like because I said like one of my problems was the story <clears throat> writing. It was that it felt like the writer the writers kind of couldn't help themselves, but talk about like IRL things, which pulls me out of the story um, really, really harsh, uh, harshly. Cause especially for stuff like sci-fi, I really want to just get immersed and like have the world feel very real. And I just couldn't do that for Borderlands cause they kept pulling me back to our world, um, trying to make hot takes. And I, I just don't like that. So that kind of burned me on the whole series. If it was just the mechanics, um, then I probably would have been able to give the Telltale one a shot because um, I at least like the Tales, like I think it's called Tales from the Borderlands. I at least like Telltale's uh, gameplay, if you want to call it that. I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, their they're, they're way of storytelling I enjoy. So I could have tried that. But yeah, I think I think that burned that series for me. Um, you you want to do uh, another one? Um, one that I started and... I will italicize this by saying I do plan to go back, and it is a beautiful game, but uh, Octopath Traveler. Ooh. So we probably just lost subscribers from me even saying that. <laughs> that might be completely fair. But um, when I got it, I played three straight hours. Like, I don't even think I moved. And I eventually, like, I grinded a lot at the beginning, just because I know how these things work and kind of better to get the grinding over with early. And so after about that, like three hour mark, I get to like the first like character meetings. And it's basically like I was a 
a, a merchant girl and I met one of the other characters and like it was like sup hi we know each other now and at that point I started like googling like is that it <laughs> and the it within kind of the the wink and nod margin of error that's pretty close to it as far as the interactions go and like as someone like you were saying that likes to get deeply involved in stories and like oh this is connected to that because of this that doesn't super exist in octopath traveler as far as i can tell that being something that i really love not being a part of the story and knowing that there isn't some super amazing connective tissue without doing like a, the golden run which from what i've read doesn't super satisfy that ensure connected itch it just really pulled me out of the experience to the point where i just didn't want to play because like the characters have limited interactions with each other so like you have other characters in your party but they're kind of strangers so it's like hi I guess I'm with you now kind of stuff. And that's, it's probably not an entirely fair assessment since I didn't play super far into it, but just from all the, the side reading, cause I don't mind spoilers. I think generally if stories are told really well, if it's spoiled for you, it's still going to be a good story. It just really took the wind out of the sails cause it's a beautiful game and the combat's really fun and, I do plan to go back, but just that initial like, oh, like I'm playing these like eight different characters that don't interlap, like connect at all. Just, uh, I don't know. Bummed me out. But yeah. I don't, certainly don't take anything away from it as being like a beautiful game, a fun game. It's just that one element that's really important to me wasn't there. Yeah, because then it kind of feels like eight, smaller games that just happen to be in the same world and that's fine if like that's what you want to do but it also is kind of i i, I agree that it wasn't completely billed as that yeah and I, I went in pretty blind so like i didn't find out that the characters don't super fraternize with each other much until i played for like like i said like i sat there for like three hours doing nothing but that mm -hmm. hopefully the sequel will remedy that a little bit I think they will, because it seems like it's a fairly general sentiment among fans of the game. Yes. But, like, the look of the game is just beautiful. So it wasn't any, like, aesthetics or gameplay. It was purely one little thing, one little hangout. Sometimes that's all it takes. Yeah. And if I were to go back and play again, which, again, I plan to, now that I know that, it's not going to irk me because i know i know that it's not coming <laughs> yeah yeah for sure um well do you want to jump into my next hot take <laughs> let's do it all right my next one is uh it's not exactly an rpg definitely turn-based though um and that is the civilizations series i quit mm -hmm. Okay, I, I will echo that I also quit this. It wasn't on my list because I had forgotten it existed, but yes. <laughs> like, I echo yeah. whatever you're going to say, like, a thousand percent. <laughs> so, my childhood best friend is super into Civilizations V. Um, and I think he's one of those people, too, that, like, bought Six and Beyond Earth and was like, no thanks, and went back to Five, which seems like what the community just kind of agreed to do. Um, and that's fine. Like, I don't begrudge you that. Sometimes, you know, the, you make a game and you just make a really good iteration of it. So, um, he got me to play Civ Five with him and I bought it for like a pretty good amount of money. I think it was on sale, but not for that much. So I definitely felt bad about this. Um, cause I didn't play it for very long. I can actually, because I still have my steam up. Um, <laughs> I can check my play time on that. The last time I played was in 2014, um, and not to date this recording too hard, but it is several years at least after 2014, and uh, 
my play t- my total play time is 5.6 hours. Mm. And I know some of you will be like, that's not enough time to decide if you like a Civ game. And maybe. Uh, the problem I had was I just felt like there was stuff missing constantly. Um, I wanted, like, the diplomacy to be a lot more diplomatic. And you can also say, like, well, if you get super into it and every civilization's being played by a real player, it gets a lot better. And I'm like, again, that may be totally the case, but I don't have, like, 20 friends I can just call up and say, hey, play this strategy game with me that will go on for multiple weeks at a time, potentially. Um, but I do have friends that have that as well. So I'm like, you know what? They seem to have a lot of fun with it, and I think that's awesome. Um, but especially the combat. Because um, I'd played some of the Total War games, and I have some fun with those. I'm real bad at them, but I still think they're fun. And I liked that I had more of an impact in how combat turned out. Because uh, the combat is kind of like an RTS in those games, a real-time strategy. Yeah, it just always felt like there was something missing. So I don't know if you want to echo that a thousand percent still, or you want to add to that. Yeah, so I I will still echo a thousand percent, but I will also add that I think that so I didn't play five. I played probably one of the original ones, one of the early ones, and it just I think what killed the experience was that I had played Age of Empires first. Yep, that too for me. Like Age of Empires is like one of the best games in existence. And I would still play Age of Empires 2 over almost any game that I've played in the last seven years. But um... <laughs> for, for me, I should specify it was Age of Mythology. Um, but same same developers and same concept. With the, mm-hmm. I, I liked that even just the concept of being left alone and city building, and that was fun to me. Yep, and the customization, just everything is so much better than the civilizations that I played that it felt like it felt like with civilizations you were watching things happen. Yes. And Age of Empires let you play what was you were watching in civilization. That is exactly what I was trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> so like civilization probably would have been an interesting movie idea, but Age of Empires is the game that's promised by it. <laughs> And yeah. had I played Civilization first, I might feel differently. I don't know. I can't time machine it, but... Uh, and some of you listening to this might go, well, I think that Civilization Builder is just not a genre that you guys appreciate, and also fair. <laughs> that may be true. Yeah. Again, just because it's not for us doesn't mean it's not for you. Um, do you want to do the next one? Or I've got... Uh, I can kind of, like fly by a couple yeah let's let's rapid fire a couple of yours just because you have way more gaming experience and quitting experience than i do so (laughs) all right um another star wars game star wars force commander um and this is another i played galaxy at war i think first or no i played age of mythology first again Um, And then this was just such a rudimentary version of that. And I do not mind bad graphics. Like, that's fine. Um, I I can go pretty retro. I I can still play Game Boy Color games today and be like, oh, this is cute and fun. The problem was the controls. We figured out RTS controls. And I'm not sure who did it first because I'm not a master of that genre or anything. But I'm going to guess maybe Age of Empires had something to do with it. We figured out how to control those games. At some point. And there there must be a fine line somewhere. I'm not sure where it is, but there must be a fine line in the sand. That games made before we figured this out are just a lot more difficult than after. Because <laughs> Force Commander, the controls were like... Normally, you like left-click and drag to highlight units, and then you right-click to move them. This, it was like... You left-click and drag, and that moves your camera. And then like... I don't even remember everything. I was playing this on like my Windows 95, so my mouse didn't even have a scroll wheel. So I don't think that was used to control anything. Um, and then right click was like select unit, maybe, and then that was also tell them where to go. 
And then there was like not a way to group units together or something. It was something that just the controls, I was like, I just am not going to be able to get around this and do it. I tried, but it was like, I'm, I'm getting completely rocked by the AI and I'm not bad at RTSs by this point. It's just like, it's like trying to play a fighting game and somebody hands you this controller that you have no clue what is or like what anything does. And you're already really good at like, or at least decent at fighting games. And you're like, okay, do I want to take the time to learn on this extremely jank controller that this one game uses? And the answer was just kind of no. Um, which makes it even funnier because my next rapid fire one is the series Earth 2150, which has the exact same reasonings behind it. Of It looked like a really cute, or I say cute a lot. It looked like a really fun RTS that was sci-fi again. And I was like, oh, neat. And I got it on like a super steep discount. It was maybe like a dollar, so I don't feel so bad for this one. But then, yeah, it was like, okay, so the controls on this are just insane. Because it's an RTS from before we figured that out. So I, I dropped it pretty quick, unfortunately. Um, and then another rapid fire one uh, that is also not an RPG at all that I just wanted to have in there was the game Comics Zone. Because that is the game I came back to more than any other to be like, no, I'm going to beat it this time. <laughs> and the answer was always, no, you forgot how... I, I stay away just long enough to forget how stupid hard that game is. And then I come back and I'm like, I'm older, wiser. I can do it now. And then I get reminded just how dumb hard that game is again. And then I quit again for a couple of years. And then I'll come back in a few more years and be like, today is the day. <laughs> <laughs> I remember playing that growing up. It was connected to the same collection of games that shining my original shining force copy was same i'm sure your story as well the sega and smash pack it's so cool because it, it you're literally playing through a frame of comics but it is brutal as far as gameplay goes punching people hurts you like existing in that game hurts you and there's not heels for very, very far points in between. It feels like it was supposed to be a game you put a lot of quarters in, but there's no ability to do that. So it's just really hard. Well, let me do my next and maybe last one. Okay. My memory is not what it used to be, so I might come up with some more by the time you're done your list. But my next one is Tactics Ogre Knights of Lotus. Lotus? Let me make sure I'm pronouncing that right. So Tactics Over the Knight of Lotus. And um, again, probably a delightful game. Uh, what killed it for me was the very first battle. I'm a wildly impatient person. That's something that probably is hard to tell through spoken word. But my patience level is incredibly low. And like that first battle was felt so slow that I just like immediately dropped it and haven't gone back again. I probably will because SRPGs. Yes, <laughs> but really, really killed it. And so many people love the game, which is why I was even thinking to try it, but it's got to pull me in faster. So I can't say no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that one is definitely another series. A lot of people love, um, and I've not played it, so I don't have an opinion on it, but I know they're doing a remaster coming up soon, so maybe that'll solve some of those issues, and that uh, might be the first one that I try as well. Again, more of a condemnation on myself than the game, most likely, <laughs> but that's mostly what this list is. So, <laughs> all right, take it away. Uh, all right, I will follow that up with my last super hot take, I think. Um and that is, uh, again, a condemnation on myself for almost the same reasons. And that is uh, Xenoblade Chronicles 2. No! <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so, my thoughts. This was the... I was going to say the opposite of Borderlands, but that's not quite true, because I didn't like any of Borderlands. Um, I liked the story of Xenoblade Chronicles 2 quite a lot. I liked all the characters I met. I put maybe like 40 hours in. And I know people will be like, you put like 40 hours into a game to walk away? 
Yes, because I looked at uh, how long there was to go, and the answer was a lot. So, um, yeah, I, I was like, that, 40 hours in that game barely felt like a dent, um, especially because I wasn't like rushing through it or anything, because that's not how I like to play you know, really immersive RPGs. Um, I just hated the combat. I, I just could not get on board with the combat. I felt like, kind of like we were talking about with Civilizations, I'm just watching my characters fight. And that might be fine, but for how often I have to do that, it just was really, really boring to me to be in combat for that long and just not like it even a little bit. And I felt kind of bummed, and I still might go back to it at some point, because the story is just so strong. The characters are so likable. Um, and it is a very, very immersive world. And it's beautiful. I, I was having fun just walking around like grassy plains and just looking at stuff and going, I can walk over there. Like, that's all like real. I can go see that. And all of that on the Switch, too. I've seen some rough Switch games, man. And the <laughs> fact that, like, you know, there's there's devs that I see that, like, make, you know, their game looks rough, and it's like, oh, well, Switch. And I'm like, no, Xenoblade Chronicles 2 exists. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. that's not an excuse. This can, this can look beautiful. Um, it's capable of a lot. And, I mean, clearly the people over at, uh, I forget who makes that, um, they clearly know what they're doing. So I'm I mean I'm definitely not ruined on the series. Definitely would like to get back to it at some point. I just am going to need more patience for the combat and uh a little bit more. I might go back and do like the Xenoblade 1 remaster and then go all the way through cuz now 3 is out and looking really really good as well. I don't know. It just seems like such a great world and a great story. Um but yeah, that that's another that's probably my hottest <laughs> RPG take. So I've been playing Xenoblade Chronicles, the the first remaster, or I think is it remaster, remake, remaster. You know, I don't, I don't remember. Like the full version, or you're yeah. playing it on the Switch, not the, the Wii. definitive edition. That's what it is. The definitive edition. That's what I'm playing. Which is the Switch one, yeah. Yep. Okay, because I know I think it came to 3DS before that. I don't remember. It's on Wii U, maybe as well. Anyway. Not sure. Uh, <laughs> and I'm really, really enjoying it. And again, it has that wonderful world feel, but it is taking me a little while to get used to that combat where it's like your moves kind of like repop, like have to reload before you can use them again. So it's like, it's like turn based motion combat, which is taking a little to get used to. And the fact that you are still attacking, even if you're not picking your attacks. So that is taking me a little bit to get used to. But uh, the game itself is just really, really good. And the characters are really fun. And I like uh, putting on all the different outfits and stuff. I also thought it was super funny with that series that uh, apparently Nintendo of America redoes the voice work for games pretty often between the PAL version, the European version, and the, the uh, American version. And I never knew this. Um, not not for a lot of games anyway. But apparently uh, Xenoblade was one that they considered doing that for. And then just were like, eh, it's too much work. That game's not going to do well. We'll just let it be the, the European version. And now, like, the British accents are so integral, I feel like, to that, <laughs> to that game to so many people. And I, I just can't imagine that not being there. I just thought that was really funny that... That was almost like an oversight, or that almost wasn't that way. But I was like, it just adds such like a a distinct flavor to the to that world to me. Um, and I know also people are going to be like, oh, it's the American thinking that the Brits are exciting, and I'm like, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, do you have any more, or w did you burn burn that that take burn so much that you're you're done? <laughs> Uh, I don't see in the light of the torches outside my house yet, so I, I can do a couple more. <laughs> the next ones I had uh, that I wanted to talk about were more just concepts. Um, the first one was any arcade game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I think um, in my area now, we have some of those pay pay to play all day arcades where like you come and you pay a flat fee of like 10 to $15 and then you can just play arcade games. And I have really, really enjoyed that. And I still really enjoy that. And I'll keep frequenting those. Um, and if you have some in your area, you should definitely check them out, uh, listener, because it's a really cool way to support gaming. But any arcade game that I can't play this way, I'm pretty much just over. <laughs> like, I just the putting in the quarters and stuff, like, I, I'm just kind of done with that at this point. Like, I don't know. There's still some other arcades in my area um, that are not that. And I went to one of those the the other day, too, and was just kind of like, yeah. No, I'm just not motivated to do this. Like, because I, it, it just, the games are made so unfair to make you keep putting in quarters. And like, I, I don't know how, what our viewer base break, breaks down to in terms of like age demographics. I'm sure some of the older people listening um, might be upset by that, but I'm just like, uh, I don't know. I feel like we have better ways to do things now. And I feel like some of our older demographic too will be like, yes. <laughs> It's not that the games are inherently bad. They're really fun. It just is the way they're set up is a little bit bad. Any comments on that one before I blaze ahead? I don't know. I haven't played many like arcade style games. So I guess I can't really comment on it. I gotcha. Just a couple that I finished uh, just for funsies was uh, I played the arcade version of Altered Beast and finished that. Um, I played House of the Dead and finished that. Um, and it's really cool to see the endings of these games that I've seen the start of lots of times. <laughs> Time Crisis. I played the arcade game for Die Hard. That was really fun. I played that one a lot as a kid because our like skating rink that I got to go to like twice a year growing up uh, had that. And it was a really fun game. Uh, and then the last one that I thought was interesting about quitting was um, just the idea that like there are some games, there's lots of games now um, that you are supposed to just play forever indefinitely. Um, but eventually you do play it for what might be the last time. Right? And I just thought that was really interesting to think about given the current landscape of like, uh, you know, like Overwatch, which was supposed to be one of those that's just up forever is gone now. Um, and they've seeded it to the, you know, they've seeded it into Overwatch 2, but that is not the same game exactly. It is in a lot of the same ways. Um, in some ways, they copied the code and slapped a two on it. But in other ways, there's, you know, the team sizes are different. And uh, so it's, and now, you know, characters are locked behind paywalls. So I'm like, yeah, that, that original Overwatch experience is gone until Blizzard has another giant PR disaster and has to do Overwatch Classic. Remember 2014? <laughs> it was a good time, good year. I don't know. Um, I don't remember when Overwatch came out. It probably wasn't that late. Or maybe it was. Maybe I'm just getting old and things that seem like uh, a long time ago or not that long, long ago. I don't know. But uh, yeah, that and uh, another Blizzard one, you know, World of Warcraft is still steadily hemorrhaging players to Final Fantasy XIV. Um, and I just thought it was interesting that like, you know, all of these, even like big MMORPGs eventually do go away. And I've played a lot of MMOs over the years that uh, I'm like, yeah, I, I'll probably get on tomorrow. And then I just don't. And I never go back. And it's not so much of a calculated decision like it is with some of the others that, you know, when I finish up a round of Civ or uh, Borderlands, you know, when I when I got to the end of those, I was pretty sure that I was like, mm, I think that I'm not going to come back to this because it just isn't very fun for me. Um, what I'm looking for, I'm just not getting out of these. Um, and it wasn't as hard of a stop as something like Aragon or Inuyasha for the DS, where I was like, oh, I'm just stuck, I guess. And I guess my solution is just to start a new file. Um, it was just a lot more of a soft quit of like, yeah, maybe I'll do this tomorrow. And then I didn't. And then I didn't the next day. And I just kind of never went back. And I, I just kind of found that interesting. Um, I don't know if you have any games like that, Daniel. So when you said that, uh, the only thing that kind of popped to mind was like, there's so many like dormant Animal Crossing GameCube villages that are now lost, lost 
to history. And it just was kind of making me somber that you had all these sweet animals that would send you stuff in the mail and now you've abandoned them. So my mind went real dark real quick. So <laughs> I'm not sure my mind are real good here. <laughs> well, I think they are because I don't even play Animal Crossing. I don't know that I've ever played an Animal Crossing game, but that's kind of where my thoughts go to. Not even having played those. It, there's just something about a game world, you know, even when you've never played, being created by devs who work really hard day in and day out to craft this world. Um, you know, at least it's in some you know, shareholders are always a thing, but at least in some capacity out of love. And then at some point it goes away. And it is kind of sad. There's something sad about that, even for like, the most hated games that just flop or do terrible. There's something, and some people just hand wave it away that are like, whatever. But like, I have enough of that preservationist in me that that makes me a little bit sad that it's like, well, you know, what if I stumble onto that? I, I'm sure maybe you've had this happen. I don't, I don't know. I've had it happen a couple times though, that I've stumbled across a trailer on YouTube or, uh, a video game channel and somebody discusses a game and I'm like, wow, that sounds really interesting. I'd like to check it out. And then I look it up and I'm like, Oh, all servers are offline. I guess I don't get to ever experience that. And it's just kind of like, and not everything can be forever. And maybe there's some beauty too. in that those experiences that we had, uh, are sort of fleeting things and that, you know, some people feel like that adds to it. I'm like totally rambling now, but just roll with me for another minute here. Kind of like, uh, yeah, you know, we all, I feel like have, I, I shouldn't say all. It seems from friends I have that are from other places, nostalgia is a very American <laughs> idea. Um, it's a very American thing that we chase, apparently, if I'm, if I'm to believe foreign friends. But it's just interesting to me that these, these games, RPGs and not, just sort of cease to exist sometimes. And I wonder now that, you know, Blizzard's in free fall and World of Warcraft is having a lot of trouble. I'm like, you know, there's a very, I mean, not soon, but I'm like, I can imagine a future in which World of Warcraft shuts down. And that's wild to think about. Um, and that kind of led me to think about other games too, that like, I've played a lot of live service games um, that's what we used to call them as live service. I don't know what the trendy name is today, but live service just means always being updated. Uh, you're supposed to play every day. I played a lot of games like that that are gone now. You know, Heroes of the Storm kind of is one of them that it's still up, but it's not really. <laughs> I mean, Blizzard shot themselves in the foot on that one. Even Club Penguin, you know, that's one that I think a lot of people had experiences on, and I, I still can't believe that got the plug pulled on it, but it's just interesting for me to think about that all of these things at some point will probably end. And it, it scares the preservationist in me a little bit that so many games are kind of pivoting to that where every, not every, but a lot of AAA games that come out right now want to be that live service and always be online. And there's a lot of RPGs doing that too. Um, and so it's just, odd that at some point uh you know you'll even the discs like i don't know if you ever go to five below daniel or if you have those in your area but it's a it's a discount store where most things are five dollars and under and i think they've expanded a little now but they had a game section which i thought was wild and it's just full of games that don't exist anymore and it's just these discs that sit here because someone uh hasn't figured out a way to get rid of them yet. So it's like, um, I can't even remember what it's called now. Oh, that's a bummer. It was a game that was supposed to compete with Overwatch. Uh, let me let me get the title of this real fast, because I should. Um, what was that very first Overwatch competitor? I remember who made it. It was actually the Borderlands people. Battleborn. There we go. Yeah, so Battleborn is just, they're taking up space still. We're recording this years after that. It's it's crazy. It's still there. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and it's like Xbox One copies, you know, PS4 copies. And if you put that game in your console today and boot it, I don't think anything happens. So it's 2016. So we're at six years out from that. Um, and yeah, that, that, those are still just sitting there. And I feel bad for like a kid that ever buys them. Because, I mean, it, it's not, you know, you'd put it in and nothing would happen because it requires an online an online service that doesn't exist anymore. But I'm like, you know, how, how commonplace will that be? And I feel bad for the devs that put a lot of time and effort into that for it to end really quickly. And there's been other ones. I think Wildstar ended was a big MMO that I thought looked neat and just didn't make it. Uh, but yeah, um, I think that about brings us to the end. Um, thank you for listening to me ramble for a little bit. But uh, I'd be interested to hear from you guys. What games did you put down and just never come back to? And was it a hard quit where you were like, oh, today is the day. This is it. Um, that's something my League of Le- Legends friends say uh, that are still playing that game say every single day. <laughs> All of them are like, today is the day. And then uh, they're still playing it. But uh, I think that's just part of the experience at this point for them. Um, but mm-hmm. was it a hard quit like that for you, or was it a soft quit where you were like, I'll come back to this, probably. And then this made you think about that, and you were like, oh yeah, that game that I bought in, you know, three years ago that I was like, I'll get back to that. I never did. Or are you still in denial about that, saying, one day I'll come back? <laughs> It's been 47 years. <laughs> yeah, in asking friends about games for this episode, um, that was the response I got as well. That it was like, you know, I was like, Did you, do you have any games that you've quit on? And uh, I got a lot of responses that were like, not that I'm willing to admit to myself. I still have that in the category of my brain of will pick back up, will return. Um, <laughs> and it's been years now, but I'll get back to it eventually. Is that you, listener? And uh, I'd also like to hear about if you uh, listened to this and that was the kick in the pants you needed to get back to that one game. Tell me what it was, and hopefully you enjoyed it. Yeah, hopefully you didn't uh, confirm your earlier feeling. (laughs) Yeah. I'm anticipating at least one comment right now that's like, yeah, thanks to you guys, I picked this game back up and remembered immediately why I put it down. (laughs) And it's still bad. (laughs) All right, well, we'll wrap it there. Thank you so much for listening. If you want more podcast stuff, you should check out our earlier episodes and our other show, Game Dev Hideout. We have lots of cool interviews coming up that you'll definitely want to hear. Lots of cool devs working on lots of really cool, interesting stuff. So go check them out and check out that show, Game Dev Hideout. You can find Turn by Turn and Game Dev Hideout wherever podcasts are sold. You can reach out to us at the Turn by Turn Pod on Twitter or on Instagram. Uh, Chris, where can people find you? That is an excellent question. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Nihil YouTube, which is also uh, where you can find my YouTube channel. Just on YouTube, Nihil, N I H I L. And uh, yeah, I play lots of SRPGs and RPG games, and I've always got something going on. Mostly Shining Force which is a game like Fire Emblem, if you're not familiar. But uh, yeah, I'm always working on stuff like that. Awesome. Well, until next time, bye, everybody. Bye.